Welcome. We're live stream with a global audience. I'm Daniel Jurgen, Vice Chairman of IHS Market. And the purpose of our session is to discuss the state of play of the energy transition uh, and the priority issues for 2022. We'll discuss how the energy transition can go smoothly, what the risks are, what the challenges are. Uh, we'll begin this uh, today with a conversation with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman, who's the energy minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And then we'll turn to uh, our discussion with our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, welcome very much, uh, Prince Abdul Aziz. Glad to have a chance to talk to you today. Uh, well, you um, oh, have it's a uh, to talk to you. Uh, yeah. Dan. It's been Good. it's been a while, at least before uh, the, season, the Christmas and New Year. We haven't talked. Yes, well, much uh, the world keeps changing, but one theme that uh, Prince Abdul Aziz said you've talked about is the is the role of energy security within the, within the energy transition. And I'd like to just ask you uh, how you see that relationship. Well, uh, luckily, uh, I have a, a record ever since uh, May last year. I've been consistent uh, with the idea that uh, we, the main pillar of, uh, of energizing the world is to ma make sure that whatever we do should be uh, uh, consistent with maintaining energy security in the broader context of energy security. Uh, it means that we, uh, we, the world does have a lot of, of an abundant resources and these resources need to be utilized, both hydrocarbon, fossil, renewable, hydrogen, uh, all of the above. We should be consistently assuring the world that no matter what happens, the, the world economy will continue to be energized. And I did talk about these three, three pillars, energy security, which is a paramount and profound, and then uh, economic growth, economic prosperity, and economic sustainability. And also, as I've always been saying, uh, mindful of climate change, these three pillars cannot be for, you know, uh, forfeited, but one of them could be forfeited for the others. I think the world has the competence, the capability, and the willingness, I hope, of working together where we can uh, achieve this, uh, maintaining these three pillars, because without them, I don't think we will ever reach uh, any of our uh, targets, be it on energy security, be it on sustainability of growth of the world economy, and be it also uh, making good of all our promises when it comes to climate change. Let me pick up on that. Uh, clearly, Saudi Arabia is, of course, uh, the forefront as an oil producer in the world and contributing to the stability of the oil market. Uh, at the same time, uh, Saudi Arabia has been taking major steps in terms of energy transition, in terms of uh, the Saudi Green Initiative, and uh, I'd like to hear what, what, what the green, how the green initiative is playing out. Well, the green initiative is much to do with what is pertaining to do in Saudi Arabia. Uh, then we have the Middle East Green Initiative, which is another initiative which we want to make sure that the, not only ourselves but even the entire region will be at work trying to deliver uh, uh, targets and uh, and maintain our commitments uh, as a region with the support and help of others within the region and outside the region. Uh, our green initiative is pillar, the main pillar of it is the circular carbon economy. Uh, we've been advocating that ever since uh, November 19, and this is way much before the, the crisis or what happened to the oil market or what have you. And we've been consistent with that. We believe that the world had uh, warrant us uh, um, a great approval in the form of both G20s in 2020 and 21. We uh, are uh, trying to, to demonstrate that the four hours of the circular carbon economy will deliver us all of the above. It will deliver us energy security because it does not get into uh, in the facetious uh, discussion of what uh, uh, energy source uh, should be of use. You know, I was in just two days ago in 
Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. And I did and would continue to repeat, we should not be picky and choosy about what energy source uh, one country uh, should use. I think it should be left to all countries to choose their own uh, fitting uh, uh, choice based on their natural national resources and national abilities. Uh, we want to make sure that the whole world congregate, and I'm at pain to, 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 to make sure that uh, our message is loud and clear, that we feel that circular company economy can deliver all of the above when it comes to the real issue and the real cause. I believe, and I hope I'm not wrong uh, in my belief, that we are all trying to congregate around the idea of reducing emissions of all greenhouse gases. And we should use every tool in, in the kit and even create any new tools in the kit to deliver us that uh, uh, that uh, target and that, uh, uh, that hope. If we are to, uh, to do that in own honesty, uh, we have to be uh, honest about are we really trying to achieve that goal uh, or are we trying to take that uh, uh, hope as a, a, a pretext to try to start choosing that we should get rid of hydrocarbon or should we could get rid of fossil fuels. We are, we are going to be working with everybody when it comes to unabated hydrocarbon, unabated fossil fuel. I think we need to work on these things and we need to deliver on these things. We need to make sure that we create the right environment for green and blue hydrogen. We're willing to work with everybody. Circular carbon economy requires also being so much more innovative about recycling and reusing. And this is a fundamental issue also because we'll find out that uh, CO2 will be a, a material as opposed to uh, something that we will, t will try to find a way here or there to get rid of it. But even if it is, you know, uh, the notion of remove is paramount in the circular carbon economy. Again, carbon sequesterization, carbon utilization, carbon capture, and creating sinks is paramount. If you look at all the initiatives of the Green, uh, uh, what his Royal Highness the Crown Prince uh, Green Initiative or Mideast uh, Green Initiative, they all speak and talk about our, not only our commitments to do that at home, but also work with others to deliver these ambitions within the Middle East and even uh, even broader, because as you may have heard, uh, Dan, we already plugged ourselves in the methane initiative. We are already working with the US and other uh, members of the new, and we're hoping, by the way, to uh, have Sierra uh, uh, Week as a launching pad for the Net Zero Forum. Uh, we, d we did it willingly and voluntarily because uh, we believe that we have uh, serious efforts uh, that we can showcase and we are not uh, different from anybody when it comes to being uh, conscious about the environment and conscious about uh, delivering us a good result when it comes to mitigating climate change. Prince Abdulaziz, can I just ask you to, how, how would you define for this global audience the circular carbon economy? Very simple. You have to work on the four R's, which is remove, and that can happen through using uh, efficiency or as we are doing and will be doing, uh, which is converting your energy mix towards something that is more economical. I'm ready anytime, any place, uh, I, I hope uh, you could give me the treat or somebody give me the treat and I will showcase you a, a case study of how Saudi Arabia will actually make more money by converging our, converting our energy mix to the one that we are targeting, which is taking away our entire power sector from using uh, a million barrel of uh, liquids towards 50% of gas and 50% of renewable 
it's it's a profound economical case that uh, I and I cannot think of any country on planet, planet Earth can that can demonstrate that. That by itself is going to give us at least a hundred million tons of uh, reduction of emissions and when in CO2 uh, emissions. Our aggregate and the uh, NDC uh, that we've just recently issued before before within the green initiative at the, at the time of the green initiative uh, and just before COP26 will get us uh, reducing our emission by 278 million ton which is uh, I repeat I would repeat that number because it's a number for people to watch it is tantamount to the emissions current emissions of uh, the countries following which is uh, Kuwait Bahrain Qatar and Oman and a little bit more than what is the current uh, emission of the UE uh, uh, taken UE separately so um, let me the, the, the recycling it's again and reusing it is about making sure that that co2 yes will be captured but it would be put into a good use where we could use it for creating more materials like carbon boards like so many other things we have sabic that are up doing something on that sort they remove as i said it's very simple carbon capture uh, air capture carbon capture and sequestration and use also we're also you know piloting it with Aramco. We're collaborating in, in, a, in a forum that is the US is hosting and it's been hosting for the last 15 years. We have nothing to hide and we are not shying away from being there and proactively engaged uh, with everybody. Right. What we want to uh, do is uh, for people to avoid uh, to, you know, I really would like to see the true colors of everybody. Are we after getting rid of hydrocarbon and fossil fuel, using climate change as a pretext for that to happen? Or are we really sincere and serious uh, in attending to climate change? And if we are, we should be uh, indifferent about what sort of energy uh, resource uh, is used so long it is being mitigated. So, uh, Prince Abdul Aziz, uh, first, very striking, 50% of your power from renewables to come. But you spoke, you just used the word colors. That brings up the subject of hydrogen, blue and green. And as a last question, just to ask you, um, what, what are the initiatives that the kingdom is doing on hydrogen? How do you see it playing out? Okay. Just last yesterday, uh, I was on the phone with uh, Franz Timmerman, and we're working with the EU and many uh, member states of the EU on green hydrogen. In fact, we are congregating with others to make sure that we scale up the market. One of the more concerning issue is this, how much green hydrogen market would be in the years to come. Once we can do that, and I hope we can do it in aggregate, because that will be the biggest enticer. Uh, we're hoping uh, that we become uh, and if we are accepted to be, uh, but I, I worry a lot because again, we may into get into an energy security issue uh, that uh, some may not like the idea of being um, seeing Saudi Arabia as also being the predominant on green hydrogen, but we will be, and we hope that we could be accepted because we would we have them work with us to be the least cost producer of green hydrogen. And you remember I did explain to you before, uh, uh, Dan, blue hydrogen is also, it's, it's gonna be, a, we will have a field day with blue hydrogen because again, we're the cheapest cost, pro cost producer of gas. We're doing a huge investment on shared gas in Saudi Arabia, and we will be dedicated amount of, uh, of that gas uh, to be used for uh, producing a blue hydrogen. There is another uh, funky uh, type of uh, hydrogen, which we call it pink now. And hopefully when we do our, our uh, nuclear uh, uh, investments, who knows, we, will, we are recruiting, by the way, young uh, uh, Saudi ladies 
uh, that they are uh, happy to see that pink coming along. So in their time, hopefully, you will see uh, a Saudi pink hydrogen being produced somewhere in Saudi Arabia. Right. It's odd that we call it pink rather than yellow hydrogen, but uh, that's the terminology. Uh, Prince Abdulaziz, thank you very much for joining us today we're, for this uh, Davos point. We are very conscious of being uh, taking care of our uh, female uh, uh, um, new recruits and new cadets. Uh, and we are becoming, uh, uh, as a country, uh, an extremely well and uh, emancipated society. Well, well, thank you very much for joining us today for Davos 2022. Look forward to seeing you in person. I'm glad to see you today. Uh, we're, we've been talking with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdul Aziz, the Energy Minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And now, uh, following on that discussion, we turn to our panel discussion uh, for a global view on, uh, on energy transition. From China, we'll have uh, Chairman Xin Bian, who's the chairman of State Grid. From the United States, Vicki Holub, who's the president and CEO of Occidental Petroleum. And from Europe, uh, Bjorn Rosengren, who's the uh, president and CEO of that technology powerhouse, ABB. And um, I guess I'd say from the world, Fatih Bur Dr. Fatih Barol, who is the executive director of the International uh, Energy Agency. So I'd like to begin, uh, welcome all of you to our discussion uh, today. Uh, begin with Chairman uh, Shin, uh, State Grid. State Grid is the largest utility in the world, the second largest company in the world, and this year is spending uh, 580 R billion RMB, almost $100 billion, just this year on its capital expenditure. Uh, Chairman Jin, we're very glad to see you. State Grid has a carbon peak, carbon neutral plan. Can you describe how that plan works? Thank you. Dear participants, dear guests, Happy New Year. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Schwab and thank the BF for inviting us to participate in this forum. And this is a very important opportunity for us to learn. We know that in September 2020, President Xi Jinping has made China's carbon peaking peak and carbon neutrality commitment. And this actually pushed the acceleration button of the Chinese energy transition. In 2021, China added more than 100 million kilowatt of solar power and wind power. And it is estimated that by 2030, the installed capacity of wind and solar power in China will go, go beyond 1.2 terawatts. As the largest utility, State Grid will act as an industrial leader, an innovation advocate, and a bold pioneer in energy transition. Under the 14th five-year plan from 2021 to 2025, we plan to invest more than 350 billion dollars in order to transit our uh, great to energy into the internet. And we also need to build a new power system with more renewables. We will promote the energy transition in the four following respects. First of all, we will build a great connect interconnectivity in order to handle the great connection of new renewable energies and large scale distribution of renewable energies. We adopted a centralized and distributed renewable energy development plan. We know that the energy base in the West area and the, the loading center in the east area, uh, between those two, there are at least 1,000 and 3,000 kilometers. So we need long distance electricity power transmission. Furthermore, in order to develop the wind, so, uh, the wind power and the coastal area, we still need the support of the state grid. That's the reason why we are focusing on strengthening the interconnectivity of grids and also the optimization of resources. Currently, we have built uh, 29 UHV ultra-high voltage projects. The longest transmission distance reached 3,300 kilometers. We also have transmitted more than 300, uh, 240 gigawatts of electricity uh, across the region and provinces. By 2030, this number will rise to 350 gigawatts. Secondly, through the system adjust adjusting ability, we will be uh, 
handle the problem of um, mismatch and also handle the intermittent and volatile nature of renewable energy. First of all, we have been building a pumped storage hydroelectricity station. Currently, we have built or we are building 63 uh, pumps, pumped storage facilities. And as did estimated that by 2030, uh, the installed capacity of pumped storage will reach 100 gigawatts. Secondly, we're doing demand side resource participation and system regulation. Currently, we have um, 37 gigawatt of adjustable loads, and this number will reach 70 gigawatts by 2030. In the meanwhile, we strive to, to support the new energy storage system, like a chemical storage system, and we're also contributing to the flexibility of thermal power plants in order, and also in order to improve the peak shaving capacity of the whole power system. Thirdly, we are doing all our utmost to increase the digitalization of the grid. We also offer facilities for the grid connection of distributed new energy development and electric cars. For example, today we have built the largest new energy cloud platform across the world and provide uh, the facility service online. We have connected 20, sorry, 2.67 million solar and wind stations we, with 540 gigawatt um, connected. We also built the largest smart car platform connecting more than 1.5 million charging stations. Fourthly, we strive to tackle the challenge of stable and safe operation of power grids brought by high penetration of new energy. We know that with the rising share of the renewable energy, the technological base and operating mechanism power system will undergo deep challenges. And we will be facing challenges in terms of grid operations. So we're doing research and development and to handle those challenges and difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Shin, for uh, such a comprehensive view. And we'll come back and ask some more specifics about uh, how State Grid is uh, preparing and adjusting for the energy transition. Let me turn now to Vicki Holub, who's the president and uh, chief uh, executive officer of Occidental Petroleum. Uh, Vicki, let me ask you how you see the U.S. oil and gas industry responding to the energy transition. I think, Dan, the response is, uh, is growing and it's maturing. And so I think that uh, certainly um, with respect to the oil and gas industry, the European companies were a bit ahead of uh, those of us here in the United States. Um, but I think that the, we're picking up steam. And, and a lot of that is due to the fact that um, I think we all realize that climate change is real, it's gonna happen and it's happening today and things need to be done to ensure that we can mitigate it. Uh, so we're all beginning um, uh, with just controlling emissions from our own operations and doing that in a different way. We've had, we have facilities today that have been in operation for 50, 60 years and without a lot of innovation on the surface. We've innovated a lot in drilling. We've innovated a lot in completions and in subsurface modeling, but the way we handle our, our products on the surface has not changed significantly. And so that's the real push, I think, for the, uh, the U.S. industry and the industry around the world. And in some places we have closed loop systems that are better equipped to um, reduce and mitigate um, methane emissions as well as CO2. And so it's, it's really important for us to continue that process of, of getting our uh, facilities into the, you know, the, the 21st, 21st century here. We've got to move into a, uh, into a better place for that. Well, Vicki, let me uh, just ask you one other question about the U.S. industry. Um, a year and a half ago or so, it looked like the shale industry, which had grown so dramatically, was in big trouble. It's now rebounded uh, very strongly. In fact, the growth uh, of the uh, U.S. shale this, uh, last year and this year is a very important element in the stability of the world oil market. Just uh, how you see what's happening with U.S. shale? Well, I think it's, uh, it gets back to that innovation piece. 
uh, we at one time in the United States, we we had uh, where we were running 1,083 rigs in December of 2018. And today we're running about 590 rigs. And we don't need to run over 1,000 rigs anymore because we've innovated to the point where we can drill wells a lot faster. Uh, our completions are a lot better in that the recovery on a per well basis is much better than it used to be. So with reduced drilling time, uh, faster time to market, improved recovery, all of that makes the, the shale business in the United States a lot stronger than it was two, three, four years ago. So being able to bounce back from this crisis has, I think, been another a sign of how we can innovate when we're when a crisis does occur. And uh, hopefully our innovation around climate change will be as dramatic, and I think it will, and I'm excited about that too. But innovation around our industry, it's always been the thing that helped us deal with it, all the challenges that we've faced, and today it's even uh, more impressive. So the United States can rebound. I do believe, though, that the, the governor on um, U.S. production will not be the technology or our capability or the resources available. It will be the investment community's concern about what discipline is. And in their view, they, they, they've been burned uh, a few times by our industry. So right now they view discipline to be um, no growth. And uh, the U.S. can grow and can grow and deliver good returns and deliver value to the shareholders, but we've got to prove that. It is striking, Vicki, that uh, U.S. production now has grown so, to the degree that it's 2 million barrels a day larger than either Saudi Arabia or Russia right now, and will grow again uh, this year. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and ask you about uh, some of the things the industry, and particularly Occidental, is doing on uh, carbon. But let me pick up uh, your, your word innovation and turn to a very innovative company, which is ABB and its president, uh, uh, Bjorn uh, Rosengren. Uh, uh, Bjorn, uh, we've been talking, and obviously even the, uh, Prince Abdulaziz was talking about uh, the pace of electrification. Of course, Chairman Sh uh, Shin uh, described the, the awesome growth of uh, electrification in China. Uh, ABB is right at the center of that. Uh, it's, and uh, electrification is proceeding in industry, in mobility, in the lives of everybody. Uh, as a company that's at the forefront of electrification, what for you are the, frontier, the new frontiers for electrification? Thank you, Dan, uh, for the question, and thank you for having me on the panel. First, I, I would like to state that today, two thirds of the total primary energy in the world goes to waste. That includes power generation, transportation, industry, and buildings. I think we need to rethink industrial production. We need to rethink transportation, and we need to uh, rethink the way we live from a sustainability angle. Let me give you some examples. And the first one is in relation to production. Mining operations need to be sustainable. Many mines have started the journey towards being fully electrified. When we look at steel production, which need to be carbon free, the technology for producing green steel is already there. And the first carbon free steel has already been delivered. And uh, finally, hydrogen, which we heard more about uh, here earlier, need to be produced using green energy. And when you look at transportation, for instance, immobility e plays an important role. And we need to make sure that the buildings we live in are both smarter and more energy efficient. We like to say the best energy is the one we don't waste, but save. In fact, energy efficiency improvement will drive more than 40% of the reduction of the energy-related greenhouse gases emissions over the next 20 years. So let's make sure that we tackle the most energy and carbon incentive industries first. This way we can make a difference where it really matters. And the good news 
is that most of the technologies needed already exist today. We recently had a capital market day at ABB focused on sustainable transports. It showed clearly that there is not one solution for all. As uh, energy needs differ between application, both in terms of power and duration. But it's clear electrification plays a big role in all these cases. You know, there can be applications where electricity storage works, like, for instance, e-mobility, where EV chargers are used to charge batteries. But in other applications, for example, in the marine industry, there can be a hybrid solution with liquid fuels, for example, green hydrogen, that provides the power for battery storage and electrical propulsions. So I, I think we need to see all this as great, uh, instead of challenges, great opportunities uh, for us. Uh, so if I conclude a little bit, besides new and efficient technologies, there is also a strong need for changing consumer choices and behavior. In fact, the International Energy Agency estimated that 55% of the emission reduction will be driven by consumer uh, choices. To reach this, the right incentives and regulation frameworks also actually need to be in, in place. Well, thank you. I'm struck by the way that you began by talking about mining as a uh, uh, industry that needs electrification, given that we know that mining is going to become a lot more important in terms of providing the materials that are needed uh, for uh, uh, really for the energy transition and will loom much larger. Um, uh, it's quite, and it's, I mean, it's a, I agree with you. It's a very important industry, and it's also an industry that takes this seriously. You know, we deal with uh, most of the mining companies globally, and I think everyone has on the agenda electrification. I mean, it's all the equipment you are using that uh, presently are using uh, diesel fuels uh, in the operation, but it's also the power generation you need, you know, to power the mining operations. And I think more or less everyone has the electrification on the agenda. So it, it's, it's important. And it's going to be an important industry that takes this move going forward. And as you know, energy efficiency has been called the fifth fuel because, uh, and because you think about it as an energy source. And I mean, I think back to the original work I did mm. uh, when I was at the Harvard Business School, that was the focus of it. Um, and uh, ABB is at the forefront of this. But as you, as you said, there's a lot of opportunity there. As you look at it, what are the biggest challenges to uh, to capturing that fifth fuel energy efficiency? You know, I personally believe that that is going to be one of the most important because we have so many big installations. Let me take an example. There are about 300 million electric motors today operating in the world. And only 20% of them are actually equipped with uh, what we call vi vi variable speed drive, which make them more efficient. They're using the last uh, the technology that are there. So by actually improving and adding these drives to the rest of these uh, motors worldwide, we would actually be able to, uh, to save 10% of the electricity in the world. So, so we're talking about really huge uh, number just to drive efficiency. Right. Well, I think that really uh, emphasizes it, that one example. Um, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn now to Fatih Baral. Uh, Fatih Bjorn has already invoked the, the writ of the IEA uh, in uh, his remarks about uh, the role the IEA uh, provides as the, uh, the overview of world energy. Uh, the IEA has over years uh, produced uh, many scenarios, but none is more famous than the net zero, uh, scenario, net zero carbon scenario you produced last spring. It's very famous. It's much discussed. People find different interpretations of it. What is the essential message of that scenario? 
Uh, many thanks, uh, Dan. It was great to hear uh, all the colleagues and their uh, deliberations from different uh, perspectives. Before going to net zero, uh, let me just uh, make a, a small uh, remark. You mentioned the energy efficiency important as the fifth uh, fuel. I don't know what the other four are, uh, but uh, at the IEA, we call energy efficiency as the first fuel. So just to put it our, uh, how should I say? Number one, uh, okay. Uh, uh, the, the, the significance we put to energy efficiency. Now, uh, Dan, this is, uh, this is uh, you are right, our uh, global uh, net zero roadmap uh, is uh, very famous uh, uh, for the overwhelming majority of the, uh, the international community. It has been embarrassed. And uh, today, uh, many governments around the world, from India to Chile, from Indonesia to South Africa, many European countries are asking us to um, uh, this global uh, uh, report, global roadmap, to make it domestic for them. And we are working uh, for the, with those countries to prepare their domestic uh, roadmap. So what is this roadmap, net zero? It is very simple. So when we were uh, in this uh, World Economic Forum, uh, we are following a lot of uh, panels uh, like this. There are many languages people speak in, different languages, English, French, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish. And there's a translation. What we have done is very simple in this book. We made a translation. The scientists around the world told us that to keep the planet as is, and to have it safe and uh, sustainable, global temperature can increase maximum 1.5 degrees Celsius, full stop. And this is the overwhelming body of the scientists around the world uh, who are all respected uh, by the IPCC. So what we have done, we have translated this 1.5 in order to reach that target, what steps need to be taken in the energy sector? We did not say it is easy, it is difficult, it is likely, unlikely. We said these have to be done. And when I look at the, our analysis, as somebody who makes his hands dirty with data every single day, to go from today, 80% of the energy coming from fossil fuels to a net zero emissions by 2050, it requires a Herculean effort. Herculean effort. Very, very difficult. But it is not impossible. Now, we have two choices. Either we continue to use unabated fossil fuel, coal, oil, and gas, and live with climate change, much more frequent and extreme weather events, or very simple, we change the way we produce and consume energy. We have these two choices. And uh, at IEA, we said, uh, if we want to reach 1.5 degrees, this and this uh, uh, steps have to be taken. For example, coal 2050, you don't have unabated coal, basically, from a major uh, uh, and, and, number one, and just for uh, people number who, one uh, fuel party, in the electricity. For people, same for oil and same for gas. Yes, Dan. Uh, for people, this is a global audience. Not everybody will know what unabated means. Can you define unabated? I think the same uh, expression uh, used the, uh, the, our Saudi uh, energy minister, uh, this is the same unabated, which means if we do not take the carbon out of the oil, gas, and uh, coal, if, because the issue is today 80% of the emissions causing climate change comes from the energy sector. Without fixing the problem in the energy sector, we have no chance whatsoever to fix our problem. And one so, good technology here is, of course, carbon capture and uh, 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 sequestration. So, then so one final thing here, I wanted to, uh, perhaps it can be a good pass to the other speaker. Here, we have to recognize the task for the developed and developing countries are at, uh, different tasks. And they have different responsibilities and different means. I just wanted to underline, as we have done, 
in our global roadmap to net uh, zero. So let me just ask you before going back to uh, our other panelists. So from this scenario, or you, from your thinking, just two numbers, what do you see as the investment that's necessary in uh, renewables over the years ahead? And what about what investment then will be necessary in oil and gas? Uh, th thank you, Dan. Uh, for the clean energy, it is renewables, carbon capture, nuclear energy efficiency, for all of them, every year, the world has to invest about three trillion US dollars. And today, we are investing about one trillion dollars. So there's a one to three gap. In terms of uh, uh, fossil fuels, we will still need fossil fuels. Uh, uh, they, their uh, contribution will decline, especially uh, uh, we will need uh, gas many years to come. Oil will decline, but uh, we will still need oil. And for uh, for that, we need about each year 300 billion US dollars. So it is what more or less what we have today. The issue is how to navigate, how to manage this clean energy transition uh, properly. And if we don't manage it properly, we will see a lot of volatility in the markets as we are seeing uh, today. So the issue is today, uh, how the governments, are they able to manage this transition in the proper, in an appropriate way, or are we going to uh, see a lot of volatility in the energy markets as we are experiencing nowadays? So thank you, Fatih. I think that you have uh, obviously pointed to uh, central risk in the energy transition, whether it's smooth or not. A lot has to do with policy and investment. I'd like to turn to back to Chairman uh, Shin uh, because of the scale and size of uh, state grid. And we've heard the word innovation uh, from uh, our other panelists and state grid has been a great innovator in ultra uh, in long distance transmission. Uh, Chairman Shin, you talked about storage being very important operationally as you bring more renewables into the energy mix. Can you tell us what you see as the uh, timing and the need in terms of storage and what you find, what will be the most important contributions to storage of electricity? Thank you for your question. First of all, I fully agree with the, uh, the other panelists who mentioned that for the energy transition, increase the energy efficiency and reduce the consumption, those are important measures that we should focus on. For state grid, we have been actively promoting the energy transition. We believe that, that we can do, we can have positive impacts on two fronts. First of all, as the largest utility company, our measures promoting the energy transition can efficiently promote global carbon emission reduction. According to research, 70% of the carbon emission arise from energy sector. And from China's perspective, 80% of the, the emission stem from energy sector. The share of power industry in energy sector is 40%, is more than 40%. Therefore, through the development and upgrade of state grid, um, we can promote renewable energy development and also promote the reduction of carbon emission. According to our calculation from 2021 to 2023, through our efforts to promote energy transition and to increase the improve the clean power level, we will reduce 22 billion tons of CO2 emission. Secondly, we will also provide important experience for the global market because in building the power system with more renewables, in promoting the power grid upgrade, we have encountered a lot of problems and challenges which are not unique to China. Those are universal challenges or hurdles. Therefore, we believe that our develop our practice and our exploration can not only bene be beneficial to China, but also provide experiences and inspiration for other countries. Of course, during the course of energy transition, you have mentioned about the energy storage. Energy storage is 
an important means for developing renewable energies in the future. And today, in terms of energy storage, we have been developing pumped storage hydroelectricity and also developing chemical energy storage. Of course, we have also developing other technologies to that, to that end. Those technologies are undergoing research and development and pilot trials. I believe that through the development of the new technology, we can con contribute to the consumption of new energy and to the stability of state grid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vicky, uh, Fatih was talking about abatement. Prince Abdul Aziz talked about carbon capture. Uh, you're thinking about carbon capture, and in particular, uh, you talked about innovation. You, uh, Oxy is innovating on a particular type of carbon capture, and I think it'd be very important to just share uh, what that is. Yes, we're, we're really excited about our direct air capture facility that we plan to build in the Permian Basin uh, with uh, beginning construction actually by the end of this year. This uh, direct air capture facility is uh, the first one will uh, extract 500,000 tons per year out of the atmosphere, uh, but the ones that follow that will each uh, extract 1 million tons per year out of the atmosphere. Uh, the reason this is so important is for those that may not realize is that the CO2 in the atmosphere is 50% higher than in pre-industrial times. So abatement of uh, current sources of CO2 emissions is not enough. What we have to do is we have to extract CO2 uh, out of the air as well. And uh, we started on our journey to, to look at uh, abatement and or removal about 10 years ago. And it was only after we... Um, uh, we worked to try to uh, develop anthropogenic sources, but realized that's a more difficult task actually than going down the path that we're going down now, because building the direct air capture facility requires just a, our decision, not the emitter's decision as well. And so we're, we're working on this. It's been exciting um, to develop this technology. And what we've been able to do is pull together existing technologies piece them together. And as Bjorn had said, uh, you know, the technology does exist. You just have to put it together in the right way and make it as efficient as possible to, uh, to do this extraction. Uh, so to support the, the direct air capture facility, we also have another technology that we're very excited about. We need to power that facility and to power the direct air capture, we're going to be a co using a combination of solar, but also a new technology called net power. And net power generates uh, electricity through the uh, combustion of hydrocarbon gases with oxygen instead of air. And it uses the CO2 to drive the turbine. And that, that process can generate a lower cost of electricity than a typical gas-fired uh, generation plant that's equipped with retrofitted with carbon capture. So this will be uh, competitive to that and better than that in that it's otherwise emission-free. It captures the CO2 as a pure stream, and then we can use that uh, in one of the three ways that we're contemplating using uh, CO2. And, and we can use it um, in our EOR operations, and, and that's why we're, we're making this, uh, this big push, is that if we can use CO2 in our EOR operations, that enables us to leverage our experience um, our expertise, our assets, and our infrastructure. So it makes it more affordable. And over time, what we are trying to help the, the world to realize is that the last bar barrel of oil produced in the world should come from an enhanced oil recovery reservoir because that can be a net zero or net negative barrel of oil. It's very similar to synthetic or biofuels. And as Fadi was talking about previously and, and in the past, uh, some of the comments he's made is that we really need to get more production out of the reservoirs we have uh, today rather than going and developing uh, sources that are in uh, pristine areas or in areas that are much higher cost. So use of CO2 enhanced oil recovery is one way to do it, converting it to products. We're also, because we have a, a strong chemicals business, 
We're also um, working on technologies to convert the CO2 that we capture to bioethylene, which will be uh, a, a big win for our chemicals uh, business. And then pure sequestration in areas where we don't have the ability to, to use the CO2 as products. And we're, we're advancing that and, and really excited about it. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a last question to Bjorn. Uh, Bjorn, uh, you, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, a lot of energy efficiency will really depend upon customers or, or consumer choices. And uh, the consumers in your case are industrial firms, customers. Uh, you mentioned the interest in mining uh, and you mentioned those 300 million motors around the world. Uh, to what degree do you find industry responsive and focused on capturing uh, energy efficiency uh, mm -hmm. that you can deliver to them? Thank you for the question. Yeah, I believe that the most industries today have this highest up on the agenda, both to uh, make sure that the present operations are efficient enough and then managing the, the transition towards more uh, renewables or uh, low carbon society. So I think it's more or less, we, we see this, uh, of course, as we are supporting our customers and, uh, and the impact we actually make is uh, help our customers to be more efficient, but also to manage this transition. And of course, we see requests uh, coming up in all type of industries. And uh, I, from my personal point of view, I think it's a quite exciting uh, time for uh, for our company, but for every other company that need to uh, transform. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Chairman Shin, uh, Vicky Holub, uh, uh, Bjorn, uh, Rosenkren, and uh, of course, uh, our other two panelists, uh, His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Abdulaziz and Fatih Baral, have, uh, you've all set out uh, really the agenda for 2022. Uh, for, and thus, uh, we have uh, fulfilled the role of uh, helping to address the, the Davos Agenda 2022 for the World uh, Energy, uh, for the World Economic Forum. And I uh, wanna thank you all for joining us for this discussion and thank our viewers around the world for joining us uh, uh, on the topic of how to navigate the energy transition in 2022 and well beyond that. Thank you very much. And thank you to our panelists.